these people have created a a system where they where they play God. And you mentioned the pendulum, and the pendulum it feels like it's benefiting because or it's working because the world that they live in is full of politicians, it's full of elites, and it's full of large corporations. But you mentioned the small businesses, the medium businesses, and of course the individual the individual participants or the consumers. And I almost feel like that pendulum, uh, if I can add to the analogy, that pendulum is while it's swinging back and forth, you know, to create you know this force, this uh, for for these institutions that we mentioned. Meanwhile, the smaller people, it's almost like that Edgar Allan Poe pendulum where here where they're slowly cutting uh, the people who are lying on the table underneath the pendulum, and they're killing they're killing these these small uh, these small participants in the economy because they don't essentially care about each individual's. Hi everyone. Today I'm so excited to talk with Oric. Uh, he's a wonderful writer that I've recently known, and he he loves Bitcoin, he loves sport, and he does some amazing work. And we recently wrote an article together on BitGuide Substack, uh, which was a wonderful experience, and it was also uh, received by Simply Bitcoin as well. So I thought. We could have a chat about that article and get to know Oric a little bit. Hey, brother, welcome. Sina, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, man. So uh, why don't we begin by uh, having you introduce your, yourself a little bit. Uh, your website is Oric, sirauric.com. And you've listed a lot of the articles and a lot of the work you do and uh, collaborations. Uh, something that really catches my eye is the declaration of monetary independence, such a such a bold uh, project. So tell us a bit about what you do and what interests you and uh, and everything. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, my name is uh, Ulrich Patillo. I go by Sir Ulrich uh, on Twitter or at Kobe Duran. That's my old gamer tag. Um, that I'll never let go of, no matter what. Um, but I, uh, you know, I started writing in Bitcoin, uh, in the Bitcoin space, the Bitcoin domain, uh, about about two years ago now, maybe a little more than two years ago, uh, on with Bitcoin Magazine, uh, published a, numerous articles on different topics, uh, how Bitcoin essentially impacts potential readers, whether they're Christians, uh, whether they're Black. Um, African-American, uh, whether it, you want to talk about the historical uh, analogies with Bitcoin and other technologies in the past, uh, whether you you care about politics and you're a voter, how does Bitcoin affect politics or your, or your perspective on voting, uh, real estate, what it means to be a consumer, uh, the, the list goes on and on, people like historic people that would have been Bitcoiners. So I try to apply Bitcoin and its, and its tenets, its faculties, its attributes um, to things that people think about uh, on a regular basis. Uh, while I'm an engineer by trade, I definitely didn't uh, grow, uh, grow or study in blockchain engineering, although I can understand the concepts and the processes pretty well. Uh, I'd rather leave those types of topics and the and the technical analysis on the price to other people. I don't really care much about uh, price analysis, technical analysis. I don't really um, like to comment too much about um, the BIPs, uh, the Bitcoin improvement protocols. Uh, I, I tend to focus on more of the ethical side of what it means to uh, the common person that will use it as a medium of exchange store value uh, in a future unit of account. Um, so yeah, I've written several articles. I I don't want to say I've so many that I've lost count. I probably have 15 published. I probably have three in the works right now. And I also uh, worked on a project called the Declaration of Monetary Independence. Uh, it has a website, uh, and or it is a website, and essentially uh, outlines uh, in sort of a Declaration of Independence style uh, the problems with fiat money and the uh, what what me and two other authors see as the as a positive positive attributes of the bitcoin network uh and we 
due to our relationship with the Bitcoin conference, the Bitcoin magazine, we were able to make a, a physical manifestation of it at the conference where people could sign it, take pictures. It's sort of like a, a morale building totem or exhibit. Um, and a lot of people uh, think it's really popular, uh, think it's really cool. I think we'll have one at Pacific Bitcoin in October of this year. And uh, yeah, it's just a, a nice uh, elementary way to share um, the pros and cons, or well, the cons about fiat and the pros about Bitcoin. Uh, so, you know, education is very important uh, because this thing is it's novel, it's moving fast, and a lot of people are going to be getting into it probably before they understand what Bitcoin really is. They, they'll see it as a stock, uh, something that they can trade and uh, make more dollars or euros from. And they don't realize that it is a self-sufficient monetary network that will actually benefit them, the individual. Uh, and so it's very important for people like you and me uh, to get that message out uh, to those people who, who actually need it as, you know, as this happening comes closer and it's going to get back into the news even more so. I see you got a list of original signers on it. Um really feels like an, an opportunity that i missed <laughs> so, yeah you know yeah, like this it, is really cool like a bunch of like like about 100 people maybe original uh, actually it's 55 i want to say and it's uh it's so funny because i think we were one off or i at first i thought we actually had the entire the identical count to the number of original signatories for the declaration of independence in the 18th century oh. it was actually accidental but we were very close and i think we ended up getting one more person to tie the number uh i don't know if we missed or not i forgot the count but uh yeah there's about 55 56 original signatories the three or the three authors and people that are varying ranges of of influence from people like uh, American Hoddle, who was very popular, you know, three, three, uh, four years ago, to you know, Corey Clipston, Corey, Peter McCormack, Peter McCormack, Shinobi. Shinobi, you know, and these are people, and 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 maybe even some people that are not known, like Bryce Von Zermulen, who you know, he's in my, he's in our Telegram group, um, but. Um, you know, to most people, he's just a, he's just a normal guy. He's a, he's a, he's an anonymous pleb, but it's like these type of people don't necessarily looking back. I mean, a lot of these people wouldn't probably want to sit in the same room with one another. Some people, <laughs> some people may, I mean, I, I even think there's people on this list that have actually blocked me. <laughs> uh, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Um, gosh, forget his name, Mike. Mike, did Mike Alfred? Alfred, yeah. Mike, Mike Alfred. Also known the, as Mike Alfred. So. Uh, yeah. So, hey, I didn't go reach out for him, but when I, at that point, I was like, oh, Mike Alfred, a bunch of, you know, a big influencer. Yeah, sure. If, if Mike Hobart or Mark Mariah can get him to sign it, so be it. But it's like, looking back at this, um, there are people who are on this list that I didn't meet until two years later, Jessica Hoddle, uh, uh, and some people I've never met. Some people, somebody on this list, I've found out I knew through a, through a friend, uh, that a former coworker and my former coworker said, oh yeah, you know, I know this guy named Ulrich. And it's like, whoa, wait, Ulrich, like Ulrich Patillo. And it's like, and it's like, <laughs> I end up finding out from an original signatory, you know, this guy, I'm like, yeah. So it's, it's very interesting how this whole list fleshed out, but it's very, yeah, it's, Looking back, you know, do I really, do we really need the original signers? I think it was novel and it was cute for, to match the declaration, but really Bitcoin is for everyone. Uh, and that's why we enable people to sign the declaration anonymously post, uh, post facto of, of making this. Uh, and right now I think we have about like, I want to say a thousand, maybe 2000 sig signatures, um, on, like on this little spreadsheet, uh, in the background. And one day, you know, we want to, we want to put this, this globe up or this map and we would map out generally where people have signed, how many people have signed from the United States or, or maybe Texas, for instance, how many people have signed, uh, in a certain part of Europe, um, how many people have signed in, in, in a, in a country in Asia. And it will just, as more signatories come in, you know, the tick will go up in each place. 
uh, and it just kind of man, it's kind of a visualization of, hey, this is where these people like like what we presented and how and how they view, you know, what monetary freedom is, uh, the choice to use a certain monetary network and not be forced to have to deal with a government currency that's essentially stealing from them on a daily basis. So it's a uh, you know, we're going to add uh, different languages. I have, I'm sitting on Spanish and, uh, and I think Turkish right now. And I've received those, those uh, translations over a year ago. And I've just been lazy because, well, not lazy, but distracted. I've been writing and, you know, networking in other ways. But, um, you know, this thing, this website is only going to grow um, as Bitcoin grows in adoption and it will grow in a, this website will grow in awareness to people as well in the future it will pr be present in uh, in future conferences and they there may even be a Bitcoin trading card for the declaration Did in you say you have a physical well. thing to sign or every every okay. the last two yeah the last two bitcoin conferences if you were to go to my website and i think it would be the gallery section you'd be able to see the two um the two bitcoin conferences in miami 2023 and 2022 um you would see the two versions of the declaration of monetary independence there and i again i plan on having it at 2023 pacific bitcoin uh, if I ever get out to Texas um, for BitBlock Boom, I don't think I'll do it this year because it's in a month, but I will definitely go do that, um, uh, present it there as well. I met, I've met Gary Leland a few times, and I think he would be very uh, open to having that as a, as a humble exhibit at his conference. So there's, there again, like I mentioned before, I've, I've spoken with Aladdin, who is the owner of BTC Trading Cards. I think there's a possibility of having a Declaration of Monetary Independence trading card uh, in a future pack one day. So there's just opportunities for this thing because it's, it's succinct, it's, uh, it's novel, it's relevant when you talk about what freedom means to people now and in the past. And uh, and it's fun. It's a great way to meet people, meet other okay. Bitcoiners. And it's nothing like saying, you know, having someone come up to you and say, I know who you are. And it's like, it's kind of a, it's kind of surreal. I like it. Yeah, man, I mean, this is a very clever idea and very useful. I mean, a, a small collection of important ideas that matter for everyone. And it's something a lot of people could agree on. And uh, it's, yeah, definitely has amazing potential. So, and it's, it's, it's evergreen, you know, so. Yes, very cool, man. Very cool. I I wasn't aware of this. Now I feel a bit uh, shamed. Yeah, go ahead and click on it yourself. Sign it. Yeah, you know, I should join. It's it's, yeah. it's it's very cool. Um, so let's see. <clears throat> I want to next next move on to, uh, maybe begin discussing our article. Uh, so how do we how do we how do we begin writing on this? I think we were just chatting around in a in a Telegram group and. I remember uh, I had this idea of looking at the issues of the, mon the monetary policy from a different perspective. And, and you know, what I do is I, I track a lot of economic data on a daily basis. It's, it's you know, I teach business, so it's I just want to understand what's going on. Uh, I have to track a lot of these indicators and data points and decision making. And a lot of it just sound, looks like, clown show to me but uh, it, it's kind of a game i have to track and you know like every month you see the whole world every couple months the whole world stops uh fed has a meeting and yes um you know a small group of people are ready to declare what they think about the future of the economy and what they think about the price of money should be and what they think about how much how many jobs are we allowed to have and how fast the economy is allowed to move on and uh, everyone buys it, you know, everyone just goes along with it. Uh, it. It has just, they have managed a wonderful psyop to to make it, it like the default for everybody. Uh, I read some of the theories of macroeconomics and uh, began thinking about it in terms of, you know, um, the, the centralization and decentralization. A lot of their ideas, you know, leads to, a very a smart group of people being able to make decisions for the whole world. And then they have all the models and formulas to tell us 
what would be the optimal choices of that group or that center. So, and the criticisms around monetary policy revolves around, you know, people who, who attack the theories in terms of, okay, this formula doesn't work or um, um, this can't deliver what it promises. But another thing that's really important, and maybe I haven't heard a lot of people talking about it, is the inequality aspect of it. You know, it's not just the fact that these people tinkering with the price of money works or doesn't work. It's also that uh, when it works, it works for some people. When it doesn't work, it hurts another group of people. So it's also, apart from the fact that I also think it doesn't achieve what they promised, but also they never say that whenever it's successful, it's, all the success goes to one group. The, the damage to the other group. So I wanted to tackle it from an equality perspective. And then we met and I also I learned that you have interest in that. And uh, ultimately I uh, got so lucky to collaborate and uh, benefit from the wonderful writing that you do. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, I, I wrote an article, um, one of my, I think it was my second one. It was talk and it, it's titled, it's titled for Black America, Bitcoin is Hope, Bitcoin is Change. Um, Isaiah Jackson, who was just on my Bitcoin Ballers podcast yesterday, you know, he wrote about uh, uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bit Black America and Bitcoin. I think that's the title. Um, bestseller, you know, back in 2019. I wrote my article in 2021. I actually, when I wrote it, I promised myself not to read his book so I don't steal any of his ideas. Um, but it's like now we're talking about with you, Asina, with this, with this type of topic. And we go, we go back to the problem that a lot of minorities, primarily black people, don't, don't really understand is that we're in a system where he heads, heads they win and tails you lose. And I think you described that um, where it's like, no matter what, it's either you're neutral and someone else is, is gaining ground or you're really getting hammered and someone else is kind of like, okay, we're in this together. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to resolve this as a, as a collective. Uh, and there's always a, there's always a demographic that takes the, the brunt of the pain and whether it's, again, the incentive, the incentives that have been built in this system for the last 50 years um, likely is let's figure out a way so that the government without without getting into any particular act or government system or or three letter let's figure out a way for the government to gain power through being relied upon rather than let's make a system where people can work out their own incentives um, and have their most opportune, uh, their, their best opportunities ahead of them as long as they can apply themselves with, with, with honest work. And while honest work is out there, the grift from government through taxation, through, uh, through uh, central planning, through crony capitalism, uh, it's too, it's essentially too much to escape. And I think you, you mentioned that at the beginning of your article, um, to quote you, uh, with the push of the button, they speed up the economy whenever we are too lazy or afraid to work and slow it down whenever we have too much quote unquote animal spirit, um, or are too productive and essentially are too productive and have too many jobs. And so there is no matter what people do, even it, like there's always the the stigma that you know black people don't work hard enough. Um, the problem is is that with a lot of these acts, with a lot of these government programs, the welfare system, um, the poorest of certain demographics, and not only in black people aren't the only people in welfare, but uh, the welfare the the welfare demographic they are incentivized to leverage that welfare system as much as possible, which penalizes the middle class more than anyone because they are also wage earners. Wage earners get punished, um, whereas asset owners benefit. And the great thing about Bitcoin is that it brings the asset class to all people. 
Um, it's a commodity. It's not a security. Um, it's a bearer asset. It's the cheap. It's you know I was at the Swan, uh, the Swan uh, monthly social last night, and I was talking to someone who essentially who owns homes, and he essentially says, "Hey, I feel like when I bought Bitcoin, it's the first time I actually owned anything." And that is, and as long as you are taking self custody, that's what's that couldn't be a true. There could be no truer statement uh, in this physical world. And so I feel like we like just looking through the things that you had said in your section. Uh, you know, it was. I remember when you I asked you, you need to write your section first, and I'll spin off of you. Uh, and then when I saw what you were writing, I'm like, oh, wow, this sounds like my old piece. It sounds like my fourth piece, uh, the inherent greed of the fiat system. I'm like, I can really uh, hammer home sort of like the Bitcoin part of this because you focused on this, the uh, you focused on more of the policy and the history. And I tied into like how Bitcoin fixes this. I thought it was a great uh, collaboration. I thought we had good synergy. We had good back and forth. Um, and it flowed. I look at it and I couldn't even tell that two people wrote it. And I think it was a, it was a great, great dynamic. And I'm, I look forward to working with you again. Absolutely. And it was very efficient too. We didn't have to like meet and uh, strategize totally independently and then connecting through the text. So let me, uh, let me uh, share some, uh, some of the ideas in the first part and maybe add some color to what I wanted to say there. See, in macroeconomics, they have this idea that, well, economy is so complex, right? How does the economy grow? It's when you and I wake up in the morning, and go out and produce value to our fellow citizens and, uh, and, and people around us. Once, once we do that, we earn wages. These, these wages or income is a representation of how much value other person thought we created for them. So it's all, it's all good and awesome. But a lot of like, millions, hundreds of millions of interactions. This is very difficult for a person who just got their PhD and thinks, you know, I, I read some economics books and I can now analyze the whole world. For them, it is, this is too much. Okay, so improving economy at the micro foundations is impossible. And there's a whole, also this science called complex system science, which teaches us that complex systems cannot be that easily analyzed. It's just very difficult to understand how millions of particles are collaborating with each other. So what the macroeconomists did was they came up with a gross simplification. They said, we don't care about individuals. We don't care about you know, human action. Instead, we will aggregate the whole thing into a bunch of numbers, like aggregate demand. I don't care about what's going on inside individual people's you know, heads and individual uh, people's demands. Uh, we just aggregate it all and we call it aggregate demand. And then there's aggregate supply. And um, we can control everybody's productivity, all the ingenuity that every one of us represent every day. They think they can control and manage it by simple parameters like interest rate. And the idea is, okay, so in certain cases, economy um, grows too fast. There's, as John Maynard Kins put it, animal spirits so i no one still knows what that is but there is animal spirits where makes people more excited and euphoric about the economy so uh, they just want to consume and prices go up and get ahead of themselves this is when the economy is red hot okay the macroeconomist says when when things are red hot we will just pull the levers and try to squeeze the economy maybe jack up the interest rates and uh, reduce the money supply so that people are not allowed to demand anymore, not allowed to purchase anymore. Okay. And they don't even care about like what subgroups of people get impacted by this. They simply change some of the settings at the top and they expect the economy to just easily and nicely flow from that and, and adjust based on it. And, uh, then the economy slows down and, and, and we get into a recession style, uh, uh, set of conditions, then they say, okay, now if we just do the reverse, reduce the interest rates and incentivize uh, people to, to demand, uh, extend more loans, we can speed up the economy. So 
in theory, that's the idea. Whenever, whenever the economy is moving too fast, we slow it down. Whenever it's too slow, we push it. And uh, it doesn't matter why people don't want to consume, you know, because a rational human being would sense risk out there and would stop consuming, would, would begin building some capital as cushion. But this is something they don't like. They want you to spend, continue spending. And they force you essentially by debasing your money. And what is a loan? A loan is basically money created out of thinner by a bank. It's a claim on the existing amount of capital in the economy. But it, but it just, as the loan gets created, that's new money. And that's new claim on the capital for which the recipient didn't do any work. Essentially, bank is deciding to take everybody's money and get a piece of it to this new person that they want to extend the loan to. And the idea is, well, uh, some of this money would end up in, in production and, 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 and generate some growth. A lot, of it, a lot of it doesn't. And when that happens, they just flush the economy with more liquidity because, you know, some of, there's a lot of frictions and a lot of the liquidity doesn't go where it should. So their solution is actually maximize it, do a lot more of it. So this is all, you know, that's the idea, that's the theory, and that's what they do in every FOMC meeting. They just look at all the data. 400 PhD economies are hired at, at the Fed to see if the economy is hot or cold. And then they make decisions according to that, and they make horrible mistakes all the time as well, as we saw with the massive uh, error in predicting inflation a couple of years ago. They were constantly saying, oh, there's not going to be inflation. And suddenly everything exploded. And so that's the general idea. And, and it gets even more ridiculous. They have this idea of Phillips curve where employment is the other side of inflation. So when there is too much employ employment, inflation goes up. The idea is, well, too much employment, tight labor market, higher, higher wages put upward pressure on prices. So but that is true in certain cases, but not always. Now, when we have inflation, their idea of dealing with inflation is to put you out of your job. So if you lose your job, you won't consume. And that is why all the time they look at employment rates to determine whether they need to tighten or, or, or stimulate the economy. And one of the ways this is super ridiculous is, I'll give you an example. Imagine something happens like a, like a war or some other issue in, in another country and our supply lines get hurt. So we don't, we don't have enough uh, input to the economy. So we have shortage of stuff. Now, in that kind of environment, when you have shortage, what, what should you do? You should work harder and produce the things that you're short, right? Um, so you need more economic activity, but because that shortage will drive inflation, these guys would come out and say, okay, we, we have to deal with inflation. Now it's become a political issue. We're not going to get enough votes, right? So to deal with that inflation, they're going to tighten the economy and limit the amount of loan and limit the uh, access of the small and medium-sized businesses to capital. So it, they hurt the amount of production which exacerbates the problem. And that's exactly what, what they're doing now as well, uh, by the way. So this is the general theory that the macro, the, the today's Keynesian macroeconomic goes by. It, it's a pendulum, right? That, that's the image we have on the article. It's a pendulum that goes from too hot to too cold. And we, if we just manage to keep this pendulum in the right position, not too hot, not too cold, that's awesome. But the... Our idea, of course, in the article is even if, first of all, they can't, but even if they're, they manage to keep this pendulum in the optimal position, they constantly produce systematic inequality as they do it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, there's so many things you hit on. I mean, just from the, uh, the rational um, Austrian perspective of, of uh, economics versus the Keynesian uh what is the word where we use where we use graphs and and, and metrics and testable things to show everything? I forget what it is. It starts with an, or uh, it see. starts with an E. I forgot. Um, but the long long story short, it's not. It's it's a uh, empirical. That's what it is. 
the yes. empirical thing, the empirical mindset is that we have the capability to test out everything in that our and our tests are completely accurate. Um, so guess what? Uh, 400 economists, all of a sudden they have godlike knowledge, you know, all all knowing knowledge to essentially dictate where the economy should go uh, and why it should go there. Whereas there's always someone who disagrees. So the question is, if all these 400 economists agree to go one direction, someone disagrees, does that person who disagrees, are they wrong or not? And if they are, if they aren't wrong, then that means that the 400 economists are wrong. But if they are, but it's a matter of, it's a matter of these people have created a a system where they is where they play god and you mentioned the pendulum and the pendulum it feels like it's benefiting because or it's working because the world that they live in is full of politicians it's full of elites and it's full of large corporations but you mentioned the small businesses the medium businesses and of course the individual the individual participants or the consumers and i almost feel like that pendulum uh, if I can add to the analogy, that pendulum is while it's swinging back and forth, you know, to create, you know, this force, this uh, for for these institutions that we mentioned. Meanwhile, the smaller people, it's almost like that Edgar Allan Poe pendulum, where here, where they're slowly cutting uh, the people who are lying on the table underneath the pendulum, and they're killing, they're killing these these small uh, these small participants in the economy because they don't essentially care about each individual's actions or each individual's incentive. And they care about their own, which represents the elite, the, 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 uh, the privileged, uh, the, the decision makers in the, in the world. And so that's like the, and all of that, all that has done is of course drive us into um, an exponentially, an exponentially increasing amount of debt all over the world. Um, you, United States is likely one of the one of the better situations. Matter, imagine all the the vassal the vassal state fiats that that fa that fall under the dollar's regime. Um, you know these countries are blowing up left and right. Whether it's uh, Uruguay, whether it's Turkey, um, Lebanon. It's a it's a mess, but we don't, you know, people, especially people in America, we are we're 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 sort of sheltered from from the from the worst of fiat's um um I guess uh, outcomes uh, consequences. I, I I guess when we go back to like what Bitcoin does for this, when it when when you just think about what can they do without Bitcoin, I I pointed to uh. A, an analogy that Jeff Booth um, put in his book *Price of Tomorrow*. Uh, there are four things that you can do to reverse economic toxic economic conditions. You can either spend less, you can default on your debt, you can expand the monetary supply, um, or you can tax and steal from the wealthy class. Now, of course, that last one is 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 abject communism. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the the other the other. They love uh, it though. Oh, so they do they they do there's always a group of people that will that will cheer on tax the wealthy tax the wealthy the wealthy will be out there tax the we saying tax the wealthy so that they can get more hits on their instagram and their twitter so they can get more money coming around because oh my gosh this person is so popular and they believe in in my in my issues and so therefore here take my money it's a uh, it's it's complete it's complete virtue signaling um but the government will never spend less because if they spend less and they lose power. Every time we hit the debt ceiling, there is this uh, there is this fake battle between parties yes. to argue, hey, we have concerns about debt, and then you have to do this and that before we even agree to uh, to 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 take one step in that direction. But right. what is super clear is at the end of the day none of these politicians would cut their own access to money and funding. They live on access to people's money. 
So they're not gonna they're not gonna stop that. They're not gonna cut their own resources. It's almost like a corny action movie that you know. No, even even a good action movie, you know that the protagonist is just not going to die, and the protagonist is like a is like a a split a split um, personality or a, or a dualistic entity. That's the Republicans and the Democrats, and they pretend like they are they are at each other's throats. But it's so funny. It's there's never been a time when oh no we're not going to raise the debt ceiling and we're going to go ahead and default on the debt and we're going to point and say it's your fault you know opposite party the catch is because they're all working together to make sure that they achieve uh this 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 long lasting power over individual participants in in the economy and so spend less default on debt never is going to happen there will always be an expansion of the mon monetary monetary supply and what that ends up who who that hurts the most well it hurts the wage earners the most and so then we talk about in this article we talk about how even even during a time when there is no no uh economic action for some reason there were more billionaires than ever before you can't you can't even fathom how is it that people and the bill not only more billionaires but the billionaires became richer I think I think I captured uh, and there were a total number of 20, 2700 billionaires in 2021, uh, which is 31 percent increase year over year from 2020 during the covid pandemic. And then the amount of money that the billionaires had. And these these are the world. This is the, the world count of billionaires. Uh, Thirteen point one trillion uh dollars of billionaire assets in 2021 which was a 63.8 percent increase year over year between 2020 and 2021 so what you have is the billionaires got a, a large magnitude richer but for some reason there is no the the world was shut down so how how is that well when they created money these people enriched themselves so much and meanwhile people in the united states they may have they may have gotten a twenty four hundred dollar check if you were married and you made you made below a certain threshold for your income it's it's essentially robbery and and the pandemic ex exposed that more than ever but because of the distractions with the politics the vaccine uh you know the virtue signaling the 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 gender problems the the movies what they should be and should not be showing we kind of forgot people forgot that that their that their earnings were being stolen forgot or didn't didn't even realize Listen, um, i mean if you're one of these billionaires are you going to say the system doesn't work are you going to say the their their the macroeconomics has flaws in it of course no. this is awesome you know you love this you will fund it you will you know pay as much money as the researchers need to pr further prove that everything works well and it's awesome and and you see no problem with it but you know the way this works is when covid hit us we we were not producing anymore. We we were sitting at home and and, and cashing uh, our checks. So that ended up stimulating the demand and killing the supply. Yes, sir. Another thing that they did was, uh, this whole this whole uh, panic over COVID hurt the fiat system in such a way that cut the is small and medium-sized firms access to funding. They essentially were not able to raise fund on the financial markets, but guess what? Biggest companies, biggest piles of capital, they had ample access. Like everyone was willing to lend to Apple, but mom and pop shops, no access to funding. So they did some programs to, to help it, but they always come short in terms of, you know, mitigating the damage fully. And so that's one way that big, oh, bigger ones always get bigger. Look at the banking system. The system is totally rigged. The smaller banks are constantly losing customer. Their funds go to the bigger banks because these big banks have the guarantee of too big to fail, right? They have the Fed put behind them. And this is just a no brainer. Everyone with a brain would say my money in the small bank is not guaranteed 
at the big bank it is guaranteed so why not i'll just move over and there's little advantage to staying with smaller the smaller banks so everyone is now predicting and this has been a proven trend that the smaller banks are are dying and big ones get bigger and then this also creates this industry of fake uh equality champions that would complain about how big our firms are and let's break them apart and 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 they have their own shows on the side so something we want to target in the article too is like we look at the similar pattern but as it happens in the housing market so uh, we basically make a simple argument we we show that once they drop the rate to zero this created easy access to funding for everyone although it was much easier for bigger guys right if you're a big company blackrock uh, invitation homes one of these huge investors in in real estate you have unlimited access to money and it's it's mind boggling you know the, the cheapest loans that individual people were able to get it was like you know 3% 2% is like i haven't even heard of 2% but invitation homes was getting loans at the getting mortgages at something like 1.4%. And so when you drop the price of money below the market, natural market level, what they will do is maximize the amount of loans they can get because every dollar of loan they get is, is profit. So they have amassed a huge amount of these loans and just bought bought homes with cash and they out out competed all the individual purchasers one of the examples one of the data points that shows it is the percentage of investors investor market share of the housing market moved from 20 percent to 18 percent during this period and in certain zip codes you know the whole area is captured by investors if this was a natural outcome of the market you said you said, uh, you said 20 percent. i think you meant 12 percent. 12 to 18 12 yeah. yep mm -hmm. okay sorry about that so, and I mean, my point is, if this was a natural outcome of the market dynamics and these investors acquired extra capital because they were smart allocators of capital, that was fine. But this yes. is just because somebody sitting there and allowing these guys easy access to money. The loans that these guys get is essentially are, are essentially call options are, are on, on our wealth. So the more loans they get, it's basically somebody deciding to allocate our wealth to these guys. Why? Not because they're the best allocators, but just because they have connections and access. And so they bought up all the homes. And now people who would have bought would have bought a house to live in, they can't afford them. And they now have to rent them. And the, and the monthly rent would be as much as their would-be mortgage. Uh, this is how they turned the the American dr dream uh, to a renting situation I'd, for a lot of people. I say the American dream into an American nap, and that's all you could do because you <laughs> you definitely can't you definitely can't have a have a good night's sleep. You can only <laughs> because you only sleep for a little bit because you're going to have to work harder and harder and harder, and that is when you when you think about the big goals that you want in life you want a pro you want property you want a home you want a car uh you want you want a nest egg for your future generations these things are be become a more fleeting of a, a, a more unreachable goal for the individual because of fiat economics because of keynesian economics uh, Austrian economics could actually be realized in a Bitcoin network. When you take away the the admin rights of a few elites to say this is how what money is worth, when you take away the ability to create loans out of nothing, loans can exist, but if you're going to give me ten million dollars worth of Bitcoin, uh. I'm going to need those keys. I'm going to need the keys to those Bitcoin in order to to uh, to enact to to act in the economy. It's not going to be oh well. Here's some paper Bitcoin. You could trust us. We have the stamp of of BlackRock. You know, trust us, bro. There's none of that. No, not your keys, not your cheese. So when you think about that, it brings hardness back into the economy. 
you loan money you loan money with the with the hope that that person is going to come and pay you back one day but there is no there is no ex, there is no fractional reserve in bitcoin and this is what people are scared of this is what the fiat bros are scared of this is what the crypto bros are scared of they don't like that they want to be able to cheat the system they want to say that's what the central bank does we want to do it too so that's why you know all what? these crypt go ahead the, the, the point you actually touched on a wonderful point i just want to add, add a little bit of a yeah sure uh, a, a extra context there the mo you, you're absolutely right mo most of the money is made in finance not by amazing intelligent allocation of capital rather by by having privileged access to information and the flows of money like you see you these days you need to subscribe to the analyses of these big big banks uh bank of america jp morgan they constantly put out morgan stanley they put out analyses that you you need and nobody else would be able to have to understand okay where pools of capital are moving if you have this information you can invest you know very very successfully and this is the information that they only have many big banks are essentially black holes nobody knows what they're doing and a lot of the success they have a lot of the profits comes from the privileged access to information with bitcoin none of that like everyone sees what's going on right and that's something you also mentioned the transparency kills a lot of these you know a lot of these profits that are not deserved essentially right i have a friend in finance and he always tell he, he i remember one time he said oh you're one of those guys that just wants to destroy everything and i'm like i don't want to i'm yeah. not a i'm not <laughs> I don't, but the, the problem is that I want to destroy the things that are causing pain and anguish and, and hurt for multiple generations and, and, and billions of people. Uh, the honesty that Bitcoin brings to the economy is something worth fighting for. It's something worth changing everything we know because everything we know is not is not the best that there is. It's just that it is the... It is what is propaganda is the propaganda that is prescribed to the masses that are too busy to figure out what the heck is going on, what the heck is going on with my money. So much so that we're even the even the most conservative or the people, the presidents that are most the supposed to be the most for the people, even the likes of Donald Trump says a little inflation is good for the economy. Even the guy who's supposed to free the people, you know, and be, you know, for all freedom would say something like that. It's a, it's a, it's an outright scam. Uh, every dollar that you have is not in your pocket is not yours. It's, it's the property of the government. It's the property of the elite. And they will take, they will take your rights to its value whenever they damn well please. And once they convert it over to CBDCs, then it's game it's game over imagine that they would be able to uh take away forget forget inflated away they'll just be able to take that number value away enough to support whatever movement uh system institution they want bitcoin put placing your savings in bitcoin building up the the what, what do you call it the circular economy in bitcoin enables you to act out in an economy that is that is hard that the money will continue to grow in value according to uh, human progress it's going to be a benefit to the wage earners it's going to be a benefit to the small businesses it's going to be a benefit to the medium businesses that don't have access to the cheap uh uh asymmetric loans that uh institutions have that governments have uh and the people that you're going to subscribe to that you think are the highly regarded uh, people in the world that know how the world works, they're going to tell you as with as much with as much power that they as they can that it's not good for you. It's toxic. It it in, it uh, incentivizes criminal activity. But meanwhile, meanwhile, what just happened is BlackRock all of a sudden, who was telling you that story forever. Uh, they switched paradigms. What happened? You know, for someone with short-term memory loss, you may, if you're living in the 1984 world, you may forget that BlackRock was telling you that it was, it was the, 
It was the tool of mo money laundering. The, the index of money laundering. Any index yeah. of money laundering. What happened? Oh, you're going to say, oh, well, maybe they had a change of heart. Maybe, just maybe they convinced you for years, for months and years to stay away from Bitcoin while they pump their bags full of it. And they're going to tell you with all the power that they have, their hands in every single industry, that Bitcoin is cool for a season. And they're going to gain when this halving happens, when the when uh, miners come back online, when money when when money gets cheap again, when the Fed loosens rates, uh, when the ETFs open up, mm -hmm. and they they are going to win off of your uh, inaction, off of your blindness to understand what real good money is for you, the individual. Uh, in my opinion, if you have any amount of extra money sitting around, there is no reason why a large majority of it shouldn't be in Bitcoin. If you have money that is that is that would if you have a do, a unit of money that could sit around for four years and you never touch it, there's no reason why it shouldn't be in Bitcoin because it has never been it has always been the case where if you hold if you have low time preference that that Bitcoin will grow in value according to whatever your favorite fiat currency is in a matter of four years or less. If you don't believe it, look at the numbers, look at the charts, and learn to have long term uh, learn to have low time preference and learn to have long term perspective on what happened in the past and what will happen in the future. You know, a couple of years ago in, in the bull market, I was uh, talking to a friend that I cared about, about Bitcoin and um, trying to orange build them. And, and she her response was that this is fake money dollar is at least backed by the government and it took me forever to debunk that idea that uh you know dollar is not even is not even yours as you said people who are a little bit uh knowledgeable about u.s institutions would also bring up the fact that if it's actually as good as you say they're gonna kill it they're gonna ban it and two three years ago two years ago you know we were this this discussion was really hot uh, this came up a lot, and we were constantly arguing that, hey, the game theory doesn't work like that. They will try to talk against it, but because they can't kill it, whatever they do, it will just grow back up more powerful. And with a couple cycles like this, they ultimately realized that there's nothing they could do except joining the network. You know, if you can't kill it, the worst thing you can do is to just prove to everyone else that you couldn't kill it, right? <laughs> so, so there is only one course of action for you, and that is to join one way or another. You could be uh, a little bit more uh, sly about it by first dissuading everybody from joining, you know, calling it an index of money laundering for a while, and then fill up your bags and then join when you feel SEC has your back and. They're, they're limiting Binance's and Coinbase's power in the market. But that's their optimal action. And that's exactly what the, the game theory predicted. And that's exactly what we see happening. You, I mean, you mentioned the sly roundabout way, um, by, as, as, play, as mentioned by Hayek in 1984. That has never been more able to be realized than... Uh, and what sly roundabout way to take money out of the hands of government. I mean, he he essentially said that over you know, almost 40 years ago, and we're living in that time frame right now. The the mystique of government power, they a lot of people really you know have grown up you know watching the movies, seeing you know seeing the action flicks and all the computers beep beep boop boop. Uh, the government is belabored by their own debt. They're they're too they're essentially too heavy, too fat to be able to uh, to be able to precisely strike out at something that is decentralized that is not even entirely in their own domain. So when we say the government, well, what government? Because there's multiple governments, and guess what? Each and every government has their own incentives. 
So you see that all governments aren't playing together. Russia doesn't seem to be on the same page as the United States right now. And I don't think they ever have been. So anything good for the United States uh essentially is bad is essentially bad in russia's eyes and vice versa so if one government were to say oh yeah we don't like that that other government say oh you don't like that we like that over there it always happens and is and i'm just giving the most obvious the most obvious uh example every single government if you treat them like an individual Every individual has their own incentives and they will pursue them. That is what essentially what the game theory is. So even if all people, even if three people say, I don't like this and one person does, and this is like this pot of gold and it's like, you don't like all this. It's like, we, we vote to ban it. I'm going to go ahead and take this pot of gold and run. That's just the way game theory works. It's being, it's being fleshed out people pretend China pretends to ban Bitcoin. Meanwhile, they're mining it undercover. Uh, you have one country adopting it with, with El Salvador. You have another country that when, when China banned it, Kazakhstan took over and then Kazakhstan taxed it. And then, the, and then all the miners left. The miners can't be destroyed because there's always going to be a place for, for them to go. So if the miners can't be destroyed, the Bitcoin's coming out and with the, and the nodes are all decentralized as well. And they're verifying transactions. You can't take, a, take out all the nodes because every single node has, every, has the record of every single Bitcoin transaction out there. So good luck trying to find all of them. Uh, you have, the governments have bigger fish to fry than trying to destroy little old Bitcoin. And it, Bitcoin, and at, at some point, they're going to realize you can't beat it. You might as well join it. Uh, and if they choose not to, they can play. They can pretend. They can play with their pretend fiat money all they want. It's going to end up. People are going to look one and another. If you were to have a Mexican peso and and a U.S. dollar, which one would you spend it first? You're going to spend that peso. Right? Why? Because you know that that dollar has a little more punch to it. You're going to look at a dollar. You're going to look at the equivalent uh, in satoshis. One day. And then you're going to say, what, well, I'm going to hold what? Everyone's getting rid of that dollar because they know the power that is in that Bitcoin. And anyone who doesn't, uh, you know, they, they deserve the price that they, they deserve the Bitcoin price that they're, that they're going to get. And at some point, it's going to be uh, by, by either omission or commission, uh, Bitcoin will become, in my eyes, the, the world standard for money. And all all nations and people will either use it, or they will be let measuring their own fiat currency against it. And uh, hardness will come back to the economy, and that will benefit you, the individual. It will benefit you, the small business owner. And people should stop, essentially, stop government simping because it's not to their benefit. And people should wake up, do their own research and realize that a hard money benefits you, the individual. I can't say that enough. Yeah, and, that, and that's that's exactly what, what we also try to say in the article, basically show people how the, how the system is eternally rigged against them. And, the, and, and they should really stop supporting it because whatever happens people default to this idea oh okay so we need more regulations we need to give this politician more power to rig the system even further to their own benefit so hopefully uh hopefully efforts like this and all the all the good work that you guys uh are doing would would en enlighten more people and i think you know initially uh, earlier i would get a bit frustrated when i'm not able to you know, convey the message to somebody. But more recently, I realized this is all justice. You know, everyone has the option to to join, to join Bitcoin, and realize its power and realize how it how fair it is. If you don't do the work, if you if you're lazy, if you're too much of a government simp, well, you're gonna pay for it. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Is there any final points that uh, you want to mention? Hmm. Um, you know, these types of engagements where we collaborate and we, where we share thoughts to, to preach, to, to, to share with the public, um, you know, 
this is so important because a lot of people are derailed by Bitcoin because it's seen as a as a game. It's compared to Dogecoin. It's compared to uh, you know Pepe Crypto and whatever whatever type of thing that looks like video game money. Uh, and it's it's seen as a uh, inconsequential, uh, not real, a waste of time. When you turn on YouTube, you're going to look at someone with wide eyes and a and a technical analysis chart, and it's either going to go point up or point down. And it does, and they never talk about why it's here in the first place and what it and what its goal is. It's not there to get you more fiat. Um, it's there to save your time. It's there to save your energy. Um, and people who don't, who look at it as just a way to get more fiat, you're going. It's a it's a trade that you will continually lose. Um, you need to adopt a plan to purchase the amount that is that keeps you solvent, and continually do that. And look for ways to earn however much fiat you need to buy however much Bitcoin you can. Because there will come a point uh, where we're going to look back and say, even at these prices, I can't believe Bitcoin was this amount of money. And we say that every year. We say that every year. I can't believe Bitcoin was this amount of money. Six months ago, we were saying, I can't believe it is 15000 Right now, we should be saying, I can't believe it's 30,000 because five years comes fast. We're all aging. Time time flies like the wind. And we're going to look back and say, wow, look back four years ago. What was Bitcoin? We're complaining that's 30,000 now. Four years ago, it was six, eight thousand dollars. This isn't a game. Uh, this this network is is going to revolutionize the world. It's going to bring deflationary money uh, back to uh, back to reality. Uh, technology is going to continue to grow, which is going to benefit you, the consumer, uh, like never before. Uh, but forces out there want to stop it um, because they want to maintain their elite place in this world without the work. Bitcoin brings work back to the economy. It's a good thing. Uh, we got to continue the fight, Cena. We got to continue yeah, the it's fight. A you know, it's probably the first time we have a technology that can break the, the grip of the crooked powers over yep. our lives. So you're so lucky to be alive this time. And yep, let's spread the message. Thank you very much, brother. Cena, thank you for having me.